All right, folks. So in today's video, we're going to talk a little bit about what the best beginner HF ham radio is. Now, this topic can start a little bit of drama because people have very strong and different opinions, and sometimes they get a little offended by something that somebody may say. So that's why I'm making this video from an expert opinion. So let's talk a little bit about ground rules, and I want to just limit the conversation to new off-the-shelf radios. There's a lot of older radios that uh, folks can get for quite a bargain, and when that happens, sometimes we make compromises, especially when we're beginners and trying something out for the first time. So uh, we're not going to include them. There's too many choices. So just for this video, we're talking about new off-the-shelf radios, and we're not going to talk about any goofy or eclectic radios here, here. You can see uh, what is called a micro bit X or a micro bit 40, and it is a DIY HF radio kit that you can put together relatively cheap. And uh, we're not going to include this. Everybody hears the story of that one guy who bought this radio, and then in 20 minutes he worked all states. But that's that one guy, that ain't you. And uh, we're going to talk about radios that are easy to use and approachable to people who are beginners. The other thing I want to talk about is some people actually get upset over saying that a radio is a good beginner's radio. They'll say things like, hell, I'm an expert, boy. I ain't no beginner. And <laughs> I probably shouldn't say it like that. But the thing is, is that they'll get upset and they'll think that you're saying that, oh, because you use a simple radio like this, you're a beginner. And it couldn't be further from the truth. If you have a radio that's a really good radio, fantastic radio, it might be good for beginners because it's easy to use, it's easy to understand, and it just works flawlessly. It has nothing to do with the operator's experience. So please don't misconstrue it that way. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, what I didn't do is include these ultra-cheap radios. I call them the ultra-cheap stuff. Uh, there was another S word that I was going to use, but I didn't want to get in trouble with YouTube. So I pointed out these uh, cheaper Chinese uh, radios. Sometimes they come as a DIY kit. Sometimes you can get them already assembled. The, the thing with these radios is, is that their interfaces are incredibly poor. They have two buttons and a knob, give or take. And uh, they're heavily menu driven and it's not easy. And sometimes the words or the terms that they use in those menus are not the standard or, or what you would expect. The other one is, is that the displays are, are difficult to read. And again, you all hear stories, well, so-and-so took this to the top of a mountain and was able to contact Japan. That's awesome. That's great that somebody was able to do that. I don't think that that categorizes itself as a beginner activity. And as a result, I would never recommend one of these as a beginner radio. I think that uh, unless you're a very, very patient man with some RF experience and you get this as your first radio, frustration is going to be the likely emotion that you experience. All right, let's keep going. So what I would consider one of the top fives and probably the number five radio is this Yesu FT891. Now, some folks are going to be like, well, dang it, it, it FT891 is the best radio. Why do you have it at number five? What's the problem? And uh, we're going to talk about a couple of different things. Uh, I think that it's a good thing that this radio is about 650 bucks. You get an amazing amount of very capable and a quality radio for that price. But there's a couple of things that uh, are missing from this. One, it doesn't have a tuner. And I'm not going to get into the argument of, well, I only use resonant antennas and I only antenna tuners are helpful and they're a great tool for beginners and it's probably the type of thing that you might want to use and I, I think that that holds this radio back a little bit the other thing is is that the uh, interface uh, some folks say it's not a problem I generally hear that from more experienced users versus less experienced users it doesn't have a, a waterfall or a color screen waterfall like you see on some other radios um, but again it's a very capable radio it doesn't have a sound card so getting um, audio in and out if you're going to do things like digital modes which is very very popular uh, with beginners these days this radio is going to be a little bit of a challenge and you're going to need some sort of external sound card interface solution um, it is 100 watts which is awesome um, the display, it's my understanding that the head unit, the display comes off and that gives you options in terms of mounting uh, choices. And that's, that's pretty good. Um, it is, if my understanding is it's 160 meters to six meters. So you don't have any UHF, VHF, shack in a box type capabilities. Yesu is a fantastic company and then uh, you would get good vendor support from them. So that's why I put it in the top five, but it is not the top radio in the top five. 
So what I have coming in, and uh, here's where the controversy starts, as a number four radio is a Zygu G90. And the first thing I'm going to say about this radio is, is that its max uh, wattage output is 20 watts. The last radio we looked at was 100 watts. And folks will say, hey, you know a QRP radio ain't good for a beginner. And that is generally accepted as true, but there's a couple of things I want to talk about. Um, I did have this radio for about two years, and uh, I traded it to a buddy for a different radio. Um, it's 20 watts output. Uh, I was able to make contacts on more than one continent, and uh, I think that that was uh, pretty handy. Uh, we're getting uh, into a better and better solar cycle. Now, granted, a solar cycle only lasts about 10, 12 years, and who knows what the next one's going to look like yet, but... Um, you should be able to make plenty of contacts with a 20 watt radio, no problem. Um, and this radio is about 400 bucks, 425, somewhere right around there, give or take. You might be able to see it a little bit more expensive on some sites and a little bit cheaper during sales. Uh, the interface on it, I liked. It was a little bit small, though. The display is small, but it has a, a pretty information rich uh, screen with a nice waterfall. Um, there were some limitations there. Uh, it has acceptable filtering, not the, not the best filtering. It does not have an internal sound card, and that's a little bit of a challenge. So, again, you have to take uh, analog audio and then convert that to a sound, through a sound card into a, uh, a digital signal or something that can be interpreted via a computing platform like a Windows 10 tablet or a Raspberry Pi. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of a challenge. Now, the face or the head unit of this radio comes apart. It separates into two. But it connects with a very old school uh, VGA cable, which I thought was a little bit weird. Uh, but you can, remount, you can mount the head remotely, uh, which is one thing. There are reports of this radio overheating. I oper operated mine outside in the sun during summer and never had a problem with it. Oh, doing FT8, which is a higher duty cycle. Uh, never, never had a problem with it. Um, it uses a really, really goofball power adapter on the back. I think they're called Tamiya cables. And uh, sometimes what we'll see is, is that people will buy off-the-shelf Tamiya cables to make a new extension cord. And they don't realize that those come with uh, reverse polarity for airsoft people. They're typically used in the airsoft space. Why it's on this radio, I've got no idea. Um, and you can see people actually create cables that are backwards and then reverse polarity, maybe cook the innards of their G90. So be careful there. Um, I'm not real sure what I oh, the tuner. This radio's got a fantastic tuner that is reported as a 10 to 1. Um, I never had a problem tuning anything that I hooked up to it uh, for an antenna, and that was great. It made, the, uh, it made this radio a nice, very portable uh, choice for me, and I enjoyed using it very much. Um, again, this is 160 to 6 meters. Uh, I, no, no, I think it's to 10. I don't believe it has 6. So it's not a shack-in-a-box solution, which is what some people are looking for, especially beginners. Let's, uh, let's keep going. Oh my, ain't she a beaut. <laughs> this is the ICOM IC7-7100. Uh, and I have it as a number three radio. And a lot of people uh, will definitely argue with me on that. These, these radios seem to, I never had one. So I'm just going to be, I'm going to come clean about that. Um, seem to have a very strong, uh, call it a cultish following. Everybody that I know who has one of these loves it. They're like, oh, that radio is great. It's fantastic. It's one of the best ever. And um, there's a lot of things that are nice about it. I believe you can get these for around $750 to $800. Um, the interface on them is usable. It's functional. You can see it right here. You can see your, your, your twin passband filters there. You can see your meter there. You can see your VFO, the frequency you're on, the mode. It, it's, it's, it's very nice, but it's dated. There are a lot better um, displays on a lot of the more modern radios. Not that this isn't modern in the history of radios, but today a color touchscreen is kind of becoming the, the thing that people want when they're looking at radios. <clears throat> and ICOM helped lead that charge. But uh, you get a lot of radio here. This is what they call shack in a box. So you get all of your HF bands and you get two meters and 70 centimeters. So some uh, VHF and UHF options there. It has a digital mode D-Star, which is a uh, ICOM. I'm not going to say ICOM only because somebody will get all upset and say Ken Wood does it too. But it's an ICOM predominant only uh, digital mode. And uh, it's they're very popular. The head unit is separate from the bottom body of the uh, radio. So you can mount it differently. Now, some folks say that that tilt is just goofy. Um, maybe. I think it would be great to have it on a desk. Other people say it mounts well on a car. Uh, you tilt actually tilt it forward a little bit, and then you can access the keypad a little bit nicer. Um, I don't really have any big complaints about it. It is a 100-watt uh, unit, and um, 
it has built-in sound card, I believe. So this this is actually a really nice radio and a good option for folks, um, especially if you don't want to kind of crest that thousand dollar threshold. This is a uh, very very popular radio that generates a lot of questions, uh, and people say, "Hey, should I get this radio? I'm a beginner, and I'm looking for something that'll do everything." And a lot of people say, well, this radio does everything okay, but it doesn't do anything exceptionally. And I'm not sure that if that's true or if they're just kind of repeating what their buddy told them. Uh, people that I know that own this radio love it. I did not get one of these. Uh, I was looking at them uh, and ended up getting a different radio. But uh, I, I like these quite a bit, and I'm going to run down why. Um, they're a little bit expensive. I think these are right now around $1,300. Uh, we are in the chip shortage age and the supply chain demand problem, so prices fluctuate a lot. So two years from now, if the price changes, I, I don't want you in the comments. Ape, you're dead wrong about that price. You need to, you need to take the whole video down. Um, I'm just telling you what the prices are about at this time. Um, the interface is really fantastic. It has a nice color uh, display there, touchscreen, and you can see the waterfall on there. You access the menu through there. Now, some folks will complain and say that, um, like Yesu, a lot of Yesu radios, this radio has a complex menuing system that might make it a little bit more difficult for new timers or beginners and i tend to i tend to agree with that the other one is is that the, the display doesn't seem to update itself in real time as uh the refresh rate is what i'm going to call it is not the same as it is on some of the icom radios and i think that that holds it back um, it does have a built-in three to one tuner which should be adequate for most folks needs built-in sound card it makes uh, digital modes extremely easy this is a very popular radio for digital mode folks it does 100 watts and um it is a shack in a box solution, meaning that it goes all the way from 160 to uh, 70 centimeters. So you get two meters, 70 centimeters. My good buddy Chuck, he loves this radio uh, and using it on two meters uh, single sideband, which is a, a popular mode where he is. That he just can't get enough of, and this is definitely the radio for that. Um, so he likes that quite a bit. We talked about Yesu, who's a fantastic company. They give good support. I would have no problem recommending somebody get a, uh, get a Yesu radio as their as their first radio. This is a very popular solution. I like it quite a bit, and uh, that's why it's ranked number two. Well, and here, and here we go with number one, and I'm definitely going to get called a fanboy, and I'm going to be called names and, and all of this kind of stuff. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the ICOM 7300, and I lumped in the 705 uh, for two reasons. These radios are actually very close in price right now. Um, they weren't. When I got my um, 7300, I want to say I paid about 900 maybe 950 for it with taxes, tags, freight, and all that stuff. Um, I, at last check, I saw they were close to $1,300, um, which is around the price of the ICOM 705. Now, uh, these, these radios both have very, very similar menuing structures and interfaces. And the, that's the reason why I'm putting them as number one. It's very easy to work these radios as opposed to the 991A, which I know is going to upset people and they're going to get mad and throw stuff. But the thing is, is that with the Yesu radio, you have to find certain settings buried deep in a menu. And that's just not the case with these ICOMs. Um, when I got uh, my 7300, I was, I was newer to HF and I was able to find and do all kinds of stuff without the need of um, checking the manual. I, I do check the manual sometimes. I'm a nerd. I do that. But the the radio interface was very intuitive for me. Uh, one of the things I don't like is that the 705 uh, interface is a little different. Not a lot different, but a little different. So sometimes you got to poke around a little bit if you're more used to one or the other. The 7300 is 100 watts, and it is HF only. The 705 is 5 watts with the internal battery, 10 watts with an external battery. Um, and it gets you uh, UHF and VHF. So it's more of a shack-in-a-box solution. It has built-in Wi-Fi, built-in Bluetooth, built-in GPS. So if you're a digital operator, particularly like a QRP portable digital, digital operator, or if that's what you know you're going to get into, um, 705 to me is a hands-down choice for a beginner radio uh, enthusiast. It's a little bit more complex. The learning curve is going to be a little bit steeper, but I think that it probably um, tailors itself to s folks who are a little bit more technical and a little bit uh, more eager to do things like digital modes. If you're just going to operate phone or voice or single sideband, um, and go out and uh, do parks on the air and soda on the air, and you're just going to talk into it. 705 is a lot more stuff than you than you actually need, so you might want to look somewhere else. Um, now, in terms of being at home in the in the shack and, and um, that kind of beginner HF radio, that's where I think that the 7300 shines. Now, it is it is expensive. 
um, at its current price. But the like we talked about the interface, you can see the waterfall or the spectrum scope on there. It makes signal finding extremely easy. Um, it has a built-in tuner for three to one. Seven to five does not. Um, both have sound cards. Uh, one thing the seven the three hundred doesn't have is. Um, dual antenna ports and people are like, well, what, what do you need dual antenna ports on that? It doesn't have UHF, VHF. I, I would like the ability to put a receive only antenna up and then maybe a RX TX antenna um, or maybe even two different antennas. Now I can beat that. I have an external tuner that has an antenna switch on it, but it would be nice if it was on the radio. That's just a small pet peeve gripe kind of thing. Um, I wish the 7300 did have better uh, remote display capabilities like HDMI out or DVI out or something like that, um, but it doesn't. Uh, and vendor support for MyCom generally is pretty dang on good, just like Yesu. Um, they're not one of the premier vendors for, uh, because they don't help people out. They're, they're very helpful. And uh, I, I called support once for a silly question that I had and they, they were great. All right, let's take a few minutes to talk about radios that didn't make the cut, but are often mentioned. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is the IC718. And the, the reason we're talking about this radio is, is that you used to be able to get these relatively cheap around 600, 650 bucks. I think they're around 750 to 800 now. Um, they have a relatively simple interface. They perform very well, and that's why uh, new hams will often use them. They, they've all f also been around for a very long time, so you're likely to find these in an Elmer shack, and he might lend one to somebody and they'll use it. The reason I didn't make the cut with it is that um, – it doesn't have a uh, sound card, built-in sound card. And today, new hams are often very eager to get on digital modes. And that adds another $150 plus wires and cables and configuration all to your ham shack that you don't need with some of the newer modernized radio. The other one is the interface. Now, a lot of people will say, ape, hey, that interface, that screen is fine with me. But generally speaking, you're not a new ham in today's world. Uh, there are people with experience that have had these radios for a long time. And when I call this a be good for beginners radio, I'm not saying if you have this radio that you're a beginner. I'm saying that you use a fantastic radio that beginners could use as well. So nobody needs to get upset about any of that. Um, it, it, it's a good radio. I think uh, think that they're priced pretty well, but um, it just didn't make the cut for me. The, uh, the next one on the list is the Zygu uh, 6100. I, I think the 100 is for the 100 problems that they've identified with it so far. Um, I don't want to hate on it too much. I know Zygu is committed to making these radios better. When they release a radio, it seems like it takes four, five, six, seven firmware updates to get it working correctly. This radio is no exception. Um, given the complexity of its internals, it's trying to do a lot. Um, you know, and you have a lower end Chinese company like Zygu, uh, probably not known for world class engineering. It just becomes very suspect to me. I think these, these are priced around 600, 650 bucks. I might be wrong. Uh, 10 watt radio uh, on paper they look really good I think they look a little, little bit better than they do in practice uh, for that kind of money I, I would look somewhere else um, it's just my opinion I, I, I can't I wouldn't recommend them the uh, the last one that gets mentioned a lot is the uh, Yesu. this picture is the uh, 817 ND which is now the 818 ND um, and it was actually my first uh, my first HF radio and one of the things I'll say about it is, is that it, it's, an, it's a nice radio. It sounds great. Um, one of the problems is, is that it's got limited interface. So you have a few buttons on there, and those buttons do multiple things depending upon which other buttons that do multiple things you pushed. So that gets a little confusing. Also, the small screen, when you're going through the menu, all the menu options are truncated. So you have to have some pretty in-depth familiarity with what that, uh, what that term or that abbreviation is and then what it does with the radio, which makes it a little bit complex. That's about as good as that screen's ever going to look because when you're uh, trying to see that in your shack or outside, the screen is dim, it's small, and you better have a magnifying glass. Um, that, that, <laughs> that, that, that's all I can tell you. Um, it's a good radio. It's a great radio, and I would recommend it to more experienced users. But to uh, folks who are just coming out and getting into the hobby, depending upon what you're going to do, like if, if, if you're going to be a soda poda, a single sideband phone user, and you've got a guy going out with you every time that's going to help Sherpa you and help you with your radio, great, great radio. But if you're buying this to set up in your shack and you want to do FT8 and you want to do SSB and then maybe – uh, participate in the, uh, I don't know, the, the Mississippi QSO party, then it's, it's probably not the radio for you. And, um, that's, and that's why it, it didn't make the cut. 
Anyhow, that is going to uh, wrap up the video, folks. I appreciate everybody watching. If you have suggestions, comments, recommendations, go ahead, post them below, and I'll do my best to respond. Thanks again. It's really appreciated.